प्रकृति के साथ संतुलित जीवन का संबंध स्थापित करना है तो इसका रास्ता हमारे सूर्य से ही प्रकाशित होगा मानवता के भविष्य को बचाने के लिए हमें फिर से सूरज के साथ चलना होगा एक्सलेंसीज जितनी ऊर्जा पूरी मानव जाति साल भर में उपयोग करती है उतनी ऊर्जा सूर्य एक घंटे में धरती को देता है और यह अपार ऊर्जा या पूरी तरह से क्लीन है सस्टेनेबल है चुनौती सिर्फ इतनी है कि सौर ऊर्जा दिन में ही उपलब्ध है और मौसम पर भी निर्भर है वन सन वन वर्ल्ड वन ग्रीड इसी चुनौती का हल है एक वर्ल्ड वाइड ग्रीड से क्लीन एनर्जी हर जगह हर समय मिल पाएगी इससे स्टोरेज की आवश्यकता भी कम होगी और सोलर प्रोजेक्ट्स की वायबिलिटी भी बढ़ेगी इस रचनात्मक पहल से कार्बन फुटप्रिंट और ऊर्जा की लागत को तो कम होगी ही अलग अलग क्षेत्रों और देशों के बीच सहयोग का एक नया मार्ग भी खुलेगा मुझे पूरा विश्वास है कि वन सन वन वर्ल्ड वन ग्रीड और ग्रीन ग्रीड इनिशिएटिव के सामंज से एक संयुक्त और सुदृढ़ वैश्विक ग्रीड का विकास हो पाएगा मैं आज ये भी जानकारी देना चाहता हूं कि हमारे स्पेस एजेंसी इसरो विश्व को एक सोलर कैलकुलेटर एप्लीकेशन देने जा रही है इस कैलकुलेटर से सैटेलाइट डेटा के आधार पर विश्व की किसी भी जगह की सोलर पावर पोटेंशियल मापी जा सकेगी यह एप्लीकेशन सोलर प्रोजेक्ट्स का लोकेशन डिसाइड करने में उपयोगी होगा एवं इससे वन सन वन वर्ल्ड वन ग्रिड को भी मजबूती मिलेगी एक्सलेंसी एक बार फिर मैं इंटरनेशनल सोलर अलायंस का अभिनंदन करता हूं और मेरे मित्र बोरिस को उनके सहयोग के लिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं मैं सभी अन्य देश के लीडर्स की उपस्थिति के लिए भी उन सबका हृदय से आभार व्यक्त करता हूं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद The acceleration of global clean energy transition is now more urgent than ever. Harnessing the power of the sun, the earth's biggest energy source, is a readily implementable solution. One world, one sun, one grid. The vision for one sun, one world, one grid was devised with this objective in mind. Announced at the first assembly of the International Solar Alliance, Osa Wog will establish global interconnected grids and new transmission lines that cross frontiers and time zones to deliver secure, reliable and affordable electricity. The partnership between the government of United Kingdom led Green Grids initiative and One Sun One World One Grid will synergize efforts to build global resilient grids that transmit solar energy from a country where the sun is shining to a country where it has set facilitating universal access to green energy and putting us on the path to just and sustainable energy transition today solar power is the strongest global solution for the climate crisis let's ensure we use this energy wisely to power a bright livable future for the generations to come Thank you Prime Minister Modi and what a wonderful example of international partnership 
shown in that film. I'm now delighted to introduce President Biden of the United States of America and invite him to speak from the left lectern. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our overriding purpose here in Glasgow is to uh, raise the ambitions uh, of our commitments to keep within reach our goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But setting ambitious targets is only half of the equation, as you all know. We also have to concrete, have concrete plans for how we're going to meet how we're going to meet those goals and decarbonize our economies to reach net zero emissions by 2050. To start, state the obvious, we have to immediately scale up clean technologies that are already commercially available and cost competitive like wind and solar energy. In the United States, we set a goal of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 creating tens of thousands of good-paying jo union jobs for American workers and meeting the power needs of almost 10,000 American homes every year. We can do this now. We don't have to wait. At the same time, we recognize that our current technology alone won't get us where we need to be. So it must also be a decisive decade for innovation, developing, demonstrating, and commercializing new clean energy technologies by 2030 so that we can — they can be widely deployed in time to meet our 2050 net zero goals. Clean hydrogen, long-duration energy storage, next-generation renewables and nuclear, carbon capture, sustainable agriculture, and so much more. We need to invest in breakthroughs. And I welcome the UK's leadership on the Glasgow Breakthrough Agenda. Innovation is the key to unlocking our future. That's why the United States is working to quadruple funding for clean energy research and development over the next four years. And we'll lead a year of action in 2022 to advance clean technologies globally. Over the past two days, I've announced several U.S. government-led initiatives to help develop and scale clean energy transmission. But we can't achieve our goals through government action alone. I'm looking at some of the men and women in front of me that can help accelerate and develop clean energy technologies. The United States and the World Economic Forum are launching the First Movers Coalition. So let me explain what the First Movers Coalition is, and I expect we already know. The First Movers Coalition is starting with more than two dozen of the world's largest and most innovative companies. The coalition represents eight major sectors that comprise 30 percent of the global emissions we now are dealing with. Steel, shipping, aluminum, concrete, trucking, aviation, chemicals, and direct air capture. These companies will be critical partners in pushing for commercially viable alternatives to decarbonize the industrial — these industrial sectors and more. <clears throat> and while championing the U.S. innovation of good-paying jobs at the same time, and the U.S. government is going to use our enormous market power as the world's largest buyer of goods and services, some $650 billion in acquisitions annually, to do the same. The government purchases that much. Together, these policies, God willing, will spur a wave of new and better products into the market and new companies and projects that will create good-paying jobs. So we're attacking the challenge from both ends. We're sending the demand signal loud and clear and investing in research and development to expand supply. We don't just want to innovate in the industrial sector. The agricultural sector also has a vital role to play. As stewards of the land, our farmers belong on the front lines of the climate fight. And together with the United Arab Emirates, I'm proud to announce the launch of Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, AIM for Climate. This is something we first proposed at my Leaders' Summit on Climate 
Over the last six months, we've worked for more than with more than 75 partners to catalyze public and private investment in climate smart agriculture and food system innovation. Today, along with 75 partners, we're going to launch a $4 billion initial investment globally. And the United States is planning to mobilize a billion of that $4 billion over the next five years, and I invite all of you to join us in working to double the investment by the time we meet at COP27. As with every aspect of the climate crisis, no one can do this alone. We need all of us working together. I know you're tired of hearing that said. It's said over and over and over again, but it's true. And as we do, the United States will lead by example and share with the world our considerable powers of innovation. And as my grandfather would say, with the grace of God, the good little neighbors and the crick not rise, and we're going to make a lot of progress. All kidding aside, I think there's virtually nothing we're unable to do, particularly when we do it together. And again, I want to thank all the private sector for their work. Thank you. Thank you, President Biden, for telling us more about the First Movers Coalition and AIM for Climate Initiative. Next, we will hear from President Kenyatta of Kenya. Please take your place at the right lectern. Thank you, and let me begin by saying what a great pleasure it is to participate in this leaders event on accelerating clean energy technology innovation and deployment and i believe that this event provides us all with a unique opportunity to accelerate innovation and the deployment of clean energy solutions to meet the goals that we set out in paris kenya recognizes the value and the interconnectedness between energy climate change, and people. And the critical role of achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Ladies and gentlemen, demand for energy is on the rise. And there are 759 million people in the world who today have no access to electricity, while 3 billion people do not have access to clean cooking fuels and technologies. At the same time, the energy sector accounts for three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions. And the critical challenge, therefore, is how to reduce carbon emissions from the energy sector while ensuring that all people have access to clean energy. We therefore need urgently to develop new clean energy technologies that meet the energy demand without exasperating greenhouse gas emissions. We in Kenya have made significant progress in advancing access to affordable and clean energy for all. And in this regard, we have increased access to electricity from below 30% in 2013 to over 75% in 2020. We have installed the biggest wind power plant in sub-Saharan Africa and are steadily exploiting and deploying available geothermal potential, currently estimated at some 10,000 megawatts, to help us push our green agenda. In these developments, Kenya has demonstrated that it is possible to achieve ambitious development goals while remaining green. Renewable energy in Kenya currently accounts for 73% of all our installed power generation capacity, and while 90% of the electricity that we use is from clean sources. We are on course to achieve our goal, our target of 100% use of clean energy by 2030, and to achieve a 100% access in clean cooking by 2028. In the framework, <laughs> thank you. 
In the framework of the high-level dialogue on energy that was held in September of this year, Kenya continues to play the role of a global theme champion on energy access with a specific focus on clean cooking. And to demonstrate our commitment, Kenya did submit an energy compact on clean cooking, indicating clear actions towards achieving universal adaptation, adoption and use of clean cooking solutions, advancing the achievements of SDG 7, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. We appreciate that low carbon energy technologies offer more sustainable ways to meet energy demand to fuel economies while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gases. However, access to and deployment of these technologies remains a persistent barrier. Nonetheless, Kenya's long and medium term policies underpin a pathway to sustainable and resilient economic growth characterized by clean and healthy environment. Countries must therefore invest more in research and innovation, including addressing challenges of technology transfer to accelerate innovations and deployment of technologies in the energy sector. Further, there is need to promote public-private partnerships and collaboration through creative efforts to foster international partnerships, information sharing, and indeed establish novel financing schemes. We in Kenya reaffirm our commitment and resolve to work with others to accelerate climate solutions, keep to 1.5 degrees, and to ensure solutions are accessible and indeed affordable for all. We join the world today in launching the Breakthrough Agenda and say that Kenya is committed to working together with all countries to accelerate the development and deployment of clean technologies and sustainable solutions. Specifically, we endorse the proposed Glasgow breakthroughs pertaining to power and green hydrogen in the energy sector and look forward to transitioning and eventually exiting from the use of coal to clean power. Further, as a commitment to fight against climate change, part of Kenya's long-term strategy that is being finalized and depending on levels of international support, as well as the principles of equity and fairness, we project to meet net zero target by 2050. We urge all parties to step up their ambition in making clean technologies the most affordable, accessible, and attractive option in their social, economic, and development interventions. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, President Kenyatta. We will now hear from President von der Leyen of the European Commission at the left lectern. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, fellow leaders, I welcome and endorse the World Leaders Summit statement on the Breakthrough Agenda. And the European Union is proud to support all four breakthroughs on power, road transport, steel, and hydrogen. I am especially glad that on this COP26, finally, we prioritize the importance of innovation because it's only through innovation that we're going to get to our goal of net zero. And therefore, scientists and innovators, entrepreneurs and investors, that's whom we have to bring together. They are central for the innovation. They are central to move towards an economy that gives more to the planet than it takes away. For Europe, the European Green Deal is the driving force behind scaling up innovation. It's the Commission and the Member States' governments 
that of course must provide legal frameworks and funding for cutting-edge technologies such as direct air captures or zero emission shipping. And of course, it's the private sector that we have to bring along too to invest to scale up the technologies that are already at the horizon, like renewable hydrogen or precision and carbon farming. It's reform and regulation and investment that we have to bring together public and private. But we should not forget the third driving force behind all of this. And these are our citizens, these are people who are asking us to deliver, to finally bring together all the things that are necessary that we move up to a true circular economy. And we know that we all have to transform our way of living, our way of working, as well as our way of producing and consuming. That's only possible through innovation, and only through innovation will we be able to take our people along. Investment, one hand, concrete action on the other hand. Horizon Europe, the world's largest publicly funded multinational research and innovation program, is worth 85 billion euros. Horizon Europe will devote at least 35% of its budget to climate objectives. And to be very concrete, just last month, we launched New Horizon missions. One is to have 100 climate neutral cities in Europe by 2030. And I'm very glad that we see finally the revival of mission innovation. Mission innovation is the striving example of global engagement. All governments pool their investments in clean energy research and innovation. It's over 95% of total government investment that we have finally in mission innovation. And it's good that it's back on the scene. We need it is, and it's good that we have it now. In our new global mission on climate neutral smart cities, we will work together with global covenant of mayors. All this, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, all this is concrete action on the ground. And in this context, I'm also very pleased to launch today, together with Bill Gates and the European Investment Bank, the EU Catalyst Programme. It is worth 1 billion euros. It's a program that will finance industries innovation, breakthrough innovation, to bring the newest climate technologies to the market in Europe. Immediately after this session, Bill and I will launch this new initiative. Fellow la leaders, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, it is innovation that leads the way. It is what citizens want of us and we will not disappoint them. The global race for net zero is on, and there is no better race to win. Thank you. Thank you, President von der Leyen. It's really exciting to hear about the European Commission's leadership on innovation, including through mission innovation, and now the new EU Catalyst Program. I'm now delighted to invite Prime Minister Akhenouch of Morocco to speak on my right. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier le Royaume-Uni, président de la COP26, d'avoir invité le Royaume du Maroc à ce sommet mondial des leaders. Je suis particulièrement ravi de nous voir y aborder le thème de l'innovation, du déploiement de la technologie propre qui se trouve au cœur des préoccupations, de nos préoccupations communes. Le nouveau modèle de développement auquel aspire le Maroc a fixé cinq paris d'avenir à relever dans les domaines stratégiques. Parmi eux figurent ceux de la recherche, innovation et de l'énergie. L'engagement du Maroc dans une dynamique de transition énergétique est un choix politique volontariste porté au plus haut sommet de l'État par Sa Majesté le Roi Mohamed VI, que Dieu l'assiste. C'est un processus 
amorcée il y a plus d'une décennie à travers une stratégie énergétique ambitieuse basée essentiellement sur la montée en puissance des énergies renouvelables, efficacité énergique et intégration régionale. L'ensemble orienté vers l'innovation adaptée et le contenu local. Actuellement, 50 projets d'énergie renouvelable cumulant une puissance installée de 3 950 MW sont déjà en service. En outre, plus de 60 autres projets sont en cours de développement ou de mise en œuvre. Dans la continuité de ces efforts en vue d'accélérer la transition énergétique, plusieurs mesures sont entreprises pour développer la biomasse énergie, les énergies marines et l'hydrogène. En matière d'innovation, le Maroc s'est doté d'infrastructures de recherche et d'innovation de pointe de la technologie dans le domaine des énergies propres, et ce, afin d'accompagner cette transition énergétique. Dans ce cadre, un réseau de plateformes de recherche d'innovation a été mis en place. Il s'agit en particulier du Green Energy Park, qui est une plateforme de recherche et d'innovation dans le domaine de technologie, ou du Green and Smart Building Park, plateforme dédiée à l'efficacité énergétique dans les bâtiments, les smart grids et la mobilité électrique. D'autres plateformes sont en cours de développement portant sur l'hydrogène, la biomasse, le Nexus Agro Energy Water ainsi que le dessalement. Des grands efforts sont également déployés pour faciliter le financement de ces projets et ce en encourageant une forte participation du secteur privé national et international. Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, le Royaume du Maroc a emprunté la voie d'un développement basé sur le développement des technologies propres sur la promotion de la recherche innovation verte et continuera à déployer ses efforts dans cette direction. Afin de conclure, je souhaite féliciter et remercier tous ceux et celles qui sont derrière cette initiative visant à garder l'objectif de 1,5% atteignable et vous assurer du soutien du Maroc à la déclaration globale de Glasgow et au lancement des percées relatives à l'énergie et à l'hydrogène. Merci. Thank you, Prime Minister Akanouch. Finally, we will turn to President Gengab of Namibia. Who I invite to speak at the left lectern to give our final leader remarks. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to tell you a little bit about what Namibia is doing to accelerate the deployment of clean technology on our shores and foster innovative approaches in line with the agenda we have gathered here to endorse. This coming decade must be a decade of action. We are running out of time. Namibia is a victim of climate change, yet it is uniquely equipped to play a vital role in crafting the needed solutions and availing the resources needed to make an impactful difference. We traveled here to announce our unequivocal support for the progressive and collaborative action required to save our planet and preserve our way of life. We have just designed, floated, and are about to award the latest tender in our nation's history in a record time, satisfying our acceptance that there is no more scope for business as usual in these dire times. We are calling for the urgent construction of green hydrogen assets in Namibia to manufacture the critical electrons and molecules needed to decarbonize our energy system. The request for proposal floated advocated for speed and urgency, challenging developers to state their emotions in terms of the scale of electrolysis development within a short period of time. In keeping of our endearment for the environment, 
we rewarded developers for illustrating how this would be done in harmony with the flora and fauna of the national park we have. In other words, we champion policy and supporting legislation that accelerated the development of clean technology and look to foster innovative approaches to sustainably decarbonize Namibia and the broader global energy landscape. The resulting proposals received estimated the number of put potential jobs to be in excess of 30,000, 30, more than double the region's existing levels of employment. For profoundly, more profoundly, they also paid homage to the people of that region and advocated for the formation of a regional development fund over and above the requirement to contribute to Namibia's soon-to-be-launched sovereign wealth fund. This sort of public-private sector collaboration captures the essence of a just and equitable energy transition. To ensure that we capture as much of the value chain in possible, as possible for our citizens, we have established a national green Hydrogen Research Institute, which will inculcate the latest cutting-edge technologies in order into the classrooms and syllabi of our tertiary institutions. I'm sorry, uh, institution. We come here to announce our support for the Glasgow Breakthrough because we appreciate that the partnership are an essential component to successfully lift the heavy burden. Namibia has always been a child of international solidarity. We remain true to these characteristics. We also Affectedly known, we are known affectedly, affectedly as a land of the brave. Never before has that name been more relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying one Namibia, one nation, one Africa, one continent, one world, one universe. That with that, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Gengab. And thank you to all of the world leaders on the panel. You're now welcome to return to your seats via the stairs on my right before we kick off the next segment. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
It's clear that countries across the globe are already making significant progress in advancing breakthroughs in power, road, transport, steel, hydrogen, and agriculture. This is not the end of the story, but the start. Powerful coalitions between governments, civil society, and businesses are how we will deliver what's needed this decade. Let's now turn to some of the people delivering this change on the ground. Our next segment will spotlight those on the front lines of the clean energy transition who are leading the charge globally to find innovative solutions on the path to repairing our planet. We are delighted to be joined today by the co-founder of the Earthshot Prize, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge, and the Earthshot Prize finalists. The Earthshot Prize is a global environment prize framed around optimism, not pessimism, to drive change and collective action over the next decade. Let's hear more from them. How many people over the years have looked at the moon and longed to visit? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Let's take inspiration and set ourselves a global challenge for this decade. For the first time, we can see that the world we live on is finite and precious. The facts are clear. The natural world is in crisis because of us. Our quality of life is contingent on our environment. There are changes in the cycles of nature that are just not normal. It's for this very reason that I launched the Earthshot Prize, the most ambitious environmental prize in history. Over the next 10 years, we will award five £1 million prizes to those who protect and restore nature. We've realized that to have a healthy economy and a healthy society, we need healthy ecosystems. Fix our climate. It is something that we are going to make possible. Clean our air. Our air is what keeps us alive. Revive our oceans. The ocean has already given us so much. Now it's time to give back. And we must build a waste-free world. Zero waste is the goal, but we're not there yet. Welcome to the first ever Earth Shop Prize, everyone. I am delighted to announce that the first ever Earth Shop is awarded to They all give us hope, which we are told springs eternal. But we don't have eternity. We need to do this now and over the next 10 years. And if we put our minds to it, I believe we can do that. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ours is a common mission to look without fear or despair at the challenges ahead in this crucial decade and to believe that we humans have the ingenuity to make the seemingly impossible possible. But only if we put our collective minds to it. For many of you, world leaders and governments in this room, that means demonstrating leadership and persuading your electorates how much this matters. For others, business leaders and philanthropists, it means transforming the clean green option into the cheapest, best and most obvious choice. Put together, it means ensuring the brightest and boldest amongst us in all sectors of society are given the support to find the answers to the most important question we face, how to repair our planet. I'm pleased to tell you that joining us in this room today are some of those best and brightest minds, the eco-innovators of our planet. They are the inaugural Earthshot Prize finalists. Two weeks ago in London, we announced the first five winners of the Earthshot Prize and awarded each £1 million to scale their solutions. Our finalists are bursting with energy, ideas and ambition 
so please expect many of them to come knocking on your doors. Their ingenuity is amazing. Their potential is off the charts. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the real superstars in this room today. Let's start with our three finalists for the Earthshot Prize to protect and restore nature. John Kehekwa from the DRC leads the Poly Poly Foundation, a community-led conservation model that shows us how communities can protect wildlife while feeding their people. Tom Crowther, based in Switzerland, leads Restore, Tom leads Restore, an online platform that unites people all over the planet to restore the world's natural ecosystems. And finally, representing our Earthshot Prize winner, the Republic of Costa Rica, Vice Minister Cynthia Bazuna. <laughs> Costa Rica has provided an example to the world that deforestation can be turned around while growing your economy. Our second earth shot, so relevant to today's discussion, is Fix Our Climate. From Bangladesh, let me introduce Eshrat Waris from Solshare. <clears throat> who pioneered an energy exchange network, allowing people to sell excess energy produced by the sun. From Nigeria, Olu Olubanjo, the founder of Ready, which makes clean energy affordable through rechargeable solar powered capsules. And finally, our winner, Vaitea Kawan, who helped create. who helped create AEM Electrolyzer in Thailand, is pioneering the use of green hydrogen, helping transform how we power our industry and vehicles. These three solutions are physically represented in the room today, so you can see for yourself how exciting they actually are. Revive Our Oceans is next. Dr. Enrique Sala, who would have been here, but he is lending his insights to another COP panel next door. He leads pristine seas from the USA, fighting to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. Next is the Living Sea Wars team in Australia, represented by Melanie Bishop, <clears throat> Their replicable seawall panels are bringing marine life back to coastal sea defences. And finally, based in the Bahamas, Sam Teicher from Coral Vita. Sam and his team won the prize with climate-resistant, fast-growing coral. Our fourth earth shot is to build a waste-free world. Yosukai Maeda from Japan has created a tiny water treatment plant. A water treatment plant called Waterbox that turns 98% of waste water into clean water. Next is David Auerbach from Sanji. Based in Kenya, their circular sanitation solution converts human waste into safe products for farmers. And our winner in this category is the city of Milan, whose food waste hubs cut waste while tackling hunger. Sadly, the mayor couldn't be with us today but I know he'd love to show you how to replicate this approach worldwide. Our final Earthshot prize is to clean our air, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to the winner, Vidyat Mohan from India. His pioneering technology creates profitable products from agricultural waste, giving farmers alternatives to the global problem of crop burning. Ma Jun from the Blue Map app couldn't be here with us today, but he's helping citizens hold polluters to account in China. And I'm almost done. I hope our finalists have given you cause for optimism. They represent a growing wave of innovators dedicating their time and talent to finding solutions to repair our planet.
Today, I'm asking you to create the conditions in which they can thrive and their ideas can scale. I will finish with an introduction to our 15th finalist, who also happens to be just 15 years old. Venetia Umashanka, who's over there, from India, is the brains behind a solar ironing cart. with the potential to improve air quality by replacing charcoal with solar power for literally millions of street vendors. This is just one of her many inventions. She puts us all to shame. Venetia, we're all privileged to share the stage with you. Over to you. For the next two weeks of COP26, we will speak about our future. Deadlines, milestones, hopes, and fears. I, however, am not here to speak about the future. I am the future. In 2030, by when we must halve our carbon emissions, I'll be just 24 years old. By 2050, when we will assess whether net zero has been achieved or not, I'll be in my early 40s, and by 2100, hopefully still going strong at 94. The point is that... <laughs> the point is that me and my generation will live to see the consequences of our actions today. Yet none of what we discussed today seems practical to me. You are deciding whether or not we will have a chance to live in a habitable world. You are deciding whether or not we are worth fighting for, worth supporting, and worth caring. Many of my generation are angry and frustrated at leaders who have made empty promises and failed to deliver. And we have every reason to be angry, but I, have no time for anger. I want to act. I'm not just a girl from India. I'm a girl from Earth, and I'm proud to be so. I'm also a student, innovator, environmentalist, and entrepreneur. But most importantly, I'm an optimist. Today, I ask with all due respect that we stop talking and start doing. We, the Earthshot Prize winners and finalists, need you to back our innovations, projects, and solutions, not an economy built on fossil fuels, smoke, and pollution. We need to stop thinking about old debates because we need a new vision for a new future. So you need to invest your time, money, and effort in us to shape our future. Now, just before we started the Earthshot Prize, we all watched a video in which the former US President, John F. Kennedy, gave his legendary moonshot speech. And here, on the COP26 stage today, I would like to update that speech for the Earthshot Prize. We, the Earthshot Prize winners and finalists, choose to, by the end of this decade, to protect and restore our nature, clean our air, revive our oceans, build a waste-free world, and fix our climate. And we are the proof that the greatest challenge that the history of our Earth has ever seen is also the greatest opportunity. We lead the greatest wave of innovation that humanity has ever known. And we choose not to complain, but to take actions that will make us healthier and wealthier. And we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And rising to these challenges will shape a new generation, a generation that will build a better world for all of us and generations to come. And on behalf of the Earthshot Prize winners and finalists, I invite you to join us. I invite you to stand with us. And we hope that you will give up the old ways of thinking and the old habits. 
But let me be clear, when we invite you to join us, we will lead even if you don't. We will act even if you delay. And we'll build the future even if you are still stuck in the past. But please accept my invite, and I assure you, you will not regret it. And finally, just remember, when it comes to climate change, there is no stop button. We can't hit pause or even rewind. We can only move together towards the future. So united we rise, and together we will definitely succeed. Thank you. A huge thank you to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge, and to Venetia Umanshankar for their remarks on the Earthshot Prize. So far today, we've heard a lot about ambition. We can all be inspired by the spirit of entrepreneurialism that the Earthshot Prize finalists have shown us. We can look forward to seeing more from these great finalists in the future. In the next segment of our event, we will hear from global business leaders scaling up the clean technology solutions we need to help solve some of the biggest challenges around the clean energy transition. Let's hear more from them now in the short film. The Glasgow breakthroughs show how world leaders, businesses and investors can take immediate action to choose that healthier, cleaner, more resilient zero carbon world. This is part of our collective race to zero emissions and we are picking up the pace. We cannot achieve this ambition without truly international and public-private collaboration. We must join forces to accelerate the deployment of clean technologies now. Invest ambitiously and work together, we can accelerate clean technology innovation, making it affordable to be deployed and scaled up across every emitting sector. The cost of solar has come down substantially over the last decade. We see it as a model where other technologies and other industries could emulate. The future of energy has already started in Bangladesh. If we can do it here, you can do it everywhere. We're ready. The technology is ready. The investment is ready. We want your unwavering commitment to accelerate the uptake of hydrogen and these zero emission fuels. If you set sufficiently clear and high ambitions and give us the right regulatory frameworks, we are ready to invest and we are ready to substantially further accelerate the green energy transformation. We've seen a remarkable coming together of government, regulators and business in recognizing the scale of the challenge. What we really need now though is clarity in terms of policy to support innovative projects. The world's population is growing. We need to prioritize climate smart agriculture. We need innovation in terms of new uh, thought breakthroughs for the food and ag sector. OLAM's uh, at source covers climate action related issues, protecting nature and biodiversity, as well as catalyzing livelihoods. Where we need help is to create a level play field and a clear definition of what is green steel. And that's why the Glasgow breakthrough is so important to drive this transformation towards 2030. So I believe it's good to set a clear signal to all of us, an end date for combustion fuel vehicles. Volvo cars will stop selling and producing fossil fuel cars by 2030. We have one final chance, as the solutions we need already exist, such as GridServe's electric forecourts, which are encouraging the uptake of electric vehicles powered by sustainable energy within the timeframes required. 
We can use green technology and new innovation to get out of the situation that we've found ourselves in now. The clean transition is the biggest economic opportunity of our time. We must seize it and accelerate the change the world needs. The time to act is now, and the choice has never been clearer. Support the Glasgow breakthroughs. You are all leaders. It's time to lead. That film is a good reminder of the sheer momentum behind the transition to clean technologies. Businesses that don't take action to be green will be left behind. Helping to drive forward this change are the initiatives named under the Breakthrough Agenda, which you can see behind me. This is not an exhaustive list, but examples of key cross-cutting initiatives and public-private partnerships accelerating the green and clean technology transition. To talk more on this topic from a business perspective, please now welcome to the stage corporate leaders from across and beyond the Glasgow breakthrough sectors. I welcome you to take your seats at the table to take part in our panel discussion today. Alicia Eastman, co-founder and president of Intercontinental Energy, a leading developer of green hydrogen and green fuels production facilities. Martina Mertz, Chairwoman and CEO of Thyssen Krupp, speaking on behalf of Thyssen Krupp Steel Europe, one of the world's leading suppliers of high-grade flat steel. Dr. Rajiv Shah, President of the Rockefeller Foundation, one of the anchor philanthropic organizations of a new international initiative I'm excited to hear more about later. Mrs. Rebecca Miano, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Kenya Electricity Generating Company, the largest producer of electricity in the East African region. Mr. Sumant Sinha, Founder, Chairman, and CEO of Renew Power, one of India's leading clean energy companies. Julie Shuttleworth, CEO of Fortescue Future Industries, which is a global green energy and product company committed to introducing zero emission green hydrogen from 100% renewable resources. And Martin Lundsted, president and CEO of Volvo Group, a multinational manufacturing corporations with brands such as Renault Trucks and Mac, showing great leadership in the road transport sector through its net zero targets. Before we kick off our panel, we will first hear from Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the founder of Breakthrough Energy. I've been fortunate enough to hear Bill speak previously about his journey to becoming a passionate advocate on climate. It's a very compelling story, and I'm sure we're all delighted to hear from such an expert on this particular subject matter. Please welcome to the stage, Bill Gates. Well, it's an honor to be here uh, on the stage. Just after the leadership remarks we, we heard from Prime Minister Johnson, President Biden, and other distinguished leader, leaders. <clears throat> it was six years ago in Paris where I joined many of these leaders to announce the first commitment to developing the innovative technologies needed to stop climate change. Today, I'm thrilled to report that that effort is going well. I committed to create Breakthrough Energy to complement the commitment from 22 countries to increase R&D through mission innovation. BEV has so far raised over $2 billion and funded over 80 companies from 11 countries across four, four continents. The progress in innovation has been very exciting. In fact, it surprised me with how well it's going. This progress has meant that we've expanded Breakthrough Energy now to cover the area of technology deployment. In order to scale these innovations to get to zero, we need to reduce the cost difference 
between the current products and the green products, a difference I call the green premium. The cost of transition must be low enough that the whole world can afford it. <laughs> to make this happen, Breakthrough Energy has added Catalyst. Catalyst is a first-of-a-kind effort to build the big projects we need to lower green premiums <coughs> and expand the market for early-stage critical climate technologies. Together with the incredible partners listed here, <coughs> Catalyst will do four things. First is harness technical expertise to understand the lowest cost path for these innovations. Second is connect government resources <coughs> with business expertise. Finally, connect grants and equity to be last mile financing, and fourth, to create markets for investors. Thank you. By guaranteeing that the green output will have customers as we bring down that green premium. With our private sector partners, we now have over one and a half billion that we expect will leverage more than 10 times that amount in public and private financing. This will support projects in four areas. And we're just getting started. Over the next year, I expect we'll more than double our financial strength. But of course, mitigation is not our only job here. Even if we hit the goal of net zero by 2050, we still have to help, particularly the developing countries, deal with the challenges of climate. People are already impacted by a warmer planet. These impacts will only get worse, especially for the world's poorest who live near the equator. We will lose the global fight against poverty if we don't help vulnerable farmers adapt to climate change. For this reason, the Gates Foundation is proud to be a partner in the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate. This new coalition was launched by the United States and the United Arab Emirates and now has over 30 member countries. As part of our work with aim for ce I'm committing the Gates Foundation to provide an additional $315 million over the next three years to the CGIAR. CGIAR is an amazing organization that provides breakthrough seeds to smallholder farmers all over the world. All of us here today have a responsibility and an opportunity to deliver these solutions. Together, we must drive a green innovation revolution, one that stops climate change, protects vulnerable communities, and continues the world on a path to progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. You have been a pioneer in addressing the need to reduce costs of clean technologies so that we can compete with and replace high-emitting products. It was a real privilege to hear you talk about the work that Catalyst will do to drive that forward. I'm thrilled now to welcome our panel of global business leaders who are with us today to shine a light on some of the action they are driving within their own companies, all of which will support the breakthrough agenda launched by Prime Minister Johnson earlier on. Raj, you are widely commended as a leader who has been invaluable in raising awareness of the most pressing global problems. I understand that today, with partners, you are launching a new international initiative which will form part of the Glasgow Breakthroughs. Please tell us more about this and the impact you expect it will have. Well, thank you, Dana, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the world leaders here today, including the outstanding and inspiring young leaders of the Earthshot Prize. I'm honored to join my private sector uh, and civil society colleagues for this important conversation. 
Uh, this week, we come together to respond to the existential threat of climate change. We also come together at a moment when the pandemic has exacerbated deep, deep inequities between those with means and those without. It is now clear the fight for the planet must also offer hope and opportunity for all its people. And thanks to advances in renewable energy technology, that is now possible. Unfortunately, from the Industrial Revolution to today's COVID-19 vaccines, advances in technology have often been inequitably distributed. We see this inequity with energy. Today, people in OECD countries currently consume, on average, 8,000 kilowatt hours of electricity each year, while 3.6 billion people in 81 energy poor countries use less, often far less, than 1,000 kilowatt hours per year. And 760 million of those, so many of them women and girls, still live completely in the dark. The question this week is whether humanity will do everything we can to ensure the renewable energy transition that's so desperately needed for our planet will also better the lives of everyone everywhere. For more than 108 years, the Rockefeller Foundation has applied the frontiers of science and technology to lift humanity. Today, together with the IKEA Foundation's Per Hagenis, the Bezos Earth Fund, and the government of Italy, we want to ensure we change energy for good, for everyone. Along with dozens of nations, multilateral institutions and development banks, and international organizations, we are pleased to launch the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. This, this, thank you. This new alliance will stand with energy poor nations seeking to accelerate their energy transitions in a way that also offers hope and opportunity for all their people. Our work will be led by these countries themselves as they transition from coal and other fossil fuels, create jobs, and expand energy access to those without. With more than $10 billion, our alliance will offer these partners catalytic capital that can unlock investment from private markets and innovative financial instruments. And today, we're opening a call for partnerships to expand our support to dozens of additional nations beyond the 12 countries in which we are already operational and active. We ask each of you to join our efforts. Together, we can cut billions of tons of CO2, avoiding a future where today's energy poor countries contribute to 75% of total global emissions. Our initial target for carbon reduction is 4 billion metric tons. We can collaborate with industry and entrepreneurs to create tens of millions of green jobs in nations with rapidly uh, growing populations and very young populations. Our initial target is to create 150 million green jobs. And we can finally, 150 years after the Industrial Revolution, which in many ways started here in Glasgow, connect those trapped in poverty because they lack access to electricity. Our initial target is to reach each and every one of those 760 million people. From Bihar, India to Nigeria, our programs are already active and delivering real, concrete, measurable results, reducing carbon, expanding access, and creating jobs. In fact, together, we can do what was once unimaginable. Ensuring the fight for our planet also lifts all of our people. Thank you, and please do join us. Thank you, Raj. That's an extraordinary initiative, and we look forward to seeing its progress as you roll it out. Rebecca, Kenjen recently received honorary recognition at the East Africa Climate Action Awards. 
for leading the region in clean energy production. What are KenGen's future plans on renewable energy deployment? And how do you work with the other actors so that clean technologies are the most affordable, accessible, and attractive option? Thank you. Thank you, Dana. First, it's an honor to speak in this forum, joining global leaders, including my president, who is a great champion of renewable energy. Kenjen is East Africa's largest electricity generator and among the top 10 leading geothermal energy producers in the world. Our installed capacity is 86% from renewable and energy sources. And Kenjen has committed to the Caring for Climate Working Group of the United Nations Global Compact with a view of refocusing our business towards sustainability. And to actualize this commitment, we have joined the business ambition for 1.5 degrees. And fortunately, our country is well endowed with renewable energy resources, and therefore, our future plans are to develop more renewable energy. In fact, our project pipeline is all green from geothermal, wind, solar, and some hydro. And Kenjan works with both state and non-state actors in support of technologies to make them the most affordable, accessible, and attractive. And the role of the state actors in Kenya includes, among others, sourcing concessionary funding from development partners for development of clean energy, creating an enabling environment and formulating policies in support of clean technologies, and also appropriate fiscal incentives that promote clean technologies for sustainable solutions. And Kenjan has also explored several opportunities with non-state actors, including financial markets, and has over the years raised funds for green energy projects through various financial instruments. We also work with technology providers for innovative clean energy solutions, including the sizing of our power plants, geothermal reservoir modeling, and even automation of operations and maintenance of our power plants through Internet of Things. I am happy to confirm that we have already commenced sharing our expertise and skills in geothermal in order to accelerate clean energy innovation in the region. In this regard, we are currently providing geothermal drilling services, geoscientific consultancy services, and capacity building in some countries in support of renewable energy deployment through their geothermal resource development. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for sharing that insight. I think it's clear that we are at a turning point in driving public-private collaboration to achieve our climate goals. But it's safe to say that it isn't just public-private collaboration which is needed. We also need the energy and new ideas which are brought forward by new companies. Alicia, your expertise in delivering cost-competitive zero-carbon fuels is central in this conversation. Some have concerns about the potential scalability of green hydrogen production. Given this, how can innovative new companies like Intercontinental Energy help to achieve the Glasgow Breakthrough target to make renewable hydrogen globally available by 2030? Thank you, Dana. Um, I guess when we first started Intercontinental Energy in 2014, scale is the thing that we thought about the most. Uh, we immediately realized that it was critical for many reasons. We'd watched solar and wind industries grow from infancy and the corresponding drop in pricing as a result of the scale and learning. When renewables became cheaper and in many places the least expensive source of power in the world, 
it started a virtuous cycle of scale and demand, and we expect the same to happen with electrolysis for the production of green hydrogen. We think it will be essentially the same trajectory, and we're probably being a little bit conservative in our, in our forecasts. But electrolyzers don't have the biggest impact. The price and stability of green, green electricity is what drives the price of hydrogen, and derivative project, derivative products um, or transport vectors like green ammonia. So to really push the prices down, we identified coastal desert sites around the world with the ideal diurnal profile. Um, this means it has a lot of sun during the day and heavy winds at night. Um, these are super green giants spread over vast uniform desert areas, and that combination of the complementary profile when you have the power coming on 24 hours a day instead of maybe two hours a day. Um, combine that with the, the large sites that reduce variability and the access to the sea for both the, desal the desalination and the splitting the water and also export, um, as well as the economies of scale generally, it creates the lowest cost of inputs across the board and ultimately the lowest possible pricing. And I think when green hydrogen and green ammonia are closer in pricing to alternative fossil fuel options, they will necessarily drive that virtuous demand cycle. In addition, as renewables are not extractive, or they're not linked to fossil fuel pricing, uh, they never deplete, and the pricing is not erratic. Uh, in fact, with each phase, it goes down in price. Um, there's a lot for off-takers to like about this competitive, stable pricing on top of green comfort. comfort. And then when you have regulations, carbon taxes, carbon intensity cert cert uh, certification programs, it only makes the green options more compelling. So there are other advantages also to going big, um, including building dedicated supply chains, uh, lower cost and assembly at sites, integrating with local partners, governments, uh, and community to provide jobs, low cost energy, and even potable water, uh, greening of the land and local industry. So for our nearly 200 gigawatt portfolio of projects, we have had steadfast support from local stakeholders. Um, in Western Australia, Minister Alana McTiernan and the whole Western Australian government are staunchly behind our two projects. Um, we have the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, uh, which ha also has major project status from the Commonwealth government. And we have the Western Green Energy Hub, uh, which is a partnership with the Murning people. Uh, traditional landowners with ownership of this project and a seat on the board. Um, WA is looking to copy that model with other projects to ensure that this truly is a just transition, that the people who own the land are also going to see the profits from this, um, as well as obviously the environmental advantages. In Oman, uh, we are happily partnered with OQ, uh, which is a subsidiary of the Oman Investment Authority, and they have the vision and foresight to harness their incredible resources to build a green uh, future. And we recently announced a green hydrogen and ammonia project we're working on with Modern Group of Saudi Arabia and Aramco. Aramco just pledged uh, net zero by 2050, and we have had tremendous support, not only from Aramco, but from the entire Saudi government, including the ministries of energy, investment, and industry. And they're all looking to produce green fuels on a massive scale. So I think we can see this as being an extremely optimistic and uh, exciting development um, when fossil fuel nations and, and states are actually getting behind these green efforts. Um, by 2030, we, we will meet the breakthrough target goals and supply green hydrogen at the lowest decile price globally so that we can decarbonize these hard to abate sectors like shipping uh, and aviation and reduce worldwide emissions, lower the capex costs for the entire industry, and we'll do that precisely by going big. Scale is the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for that very inspiring and optimistic view on how clean technology can be deployed more widely and be made much more accessible to the wider population. Um, Sumant, you are a leading entrepreneur and have ensured that Renew Power has been at the forefront of leading climate action in India. The Power Breakthrough aims for clean power to be the most affordable and reliable option for all countries by 2030. Of course, renewable energy is already the cheapest option in most places around the world, 
From your perspective in India, how do you see the development of renewable energy deployment in the coming years? Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, question, Dana. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm very grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to address all of you today. I think that the very future of our planet and of humanity depends on the policies and actions taken by the leaders present here. Uh, having said that, I'm actually an optimist. Uh, I do believe that the confluence of new technologies, better policy making, civil society awareness, global collaboration, uh, have now crossed a tipping point. Solutions which can be implemented at massive scale, like renewable energy, and are increasingly cost effective, are now at hand. Nations must use this opportunity to enhance their climate ambitions, fulfill promises made, and display greater collaboration to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius dream alive. A product of such a collaboration has been our company, Renew Power, which in our 10-year journey has now become the leading renewable energy company in India and one of the largest renewable energy companies in the world. Our home market is India, where we now have more than 10 gigawatts of solar, wind, and hydro projects commissioned or in construction, while our investors are from all over the world, including a majority from the US and others spanning the Middle East, Japan, and Canada. We are listed on the NASDAQ in the US and have greatly benefited from global collaboration. Another key element of our success story has been the unflinching support of a dynamic and visionary leader, uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Prime Minister Modi has created a highly conducive policy framework that has enabled clean energy capacity in India to grow five times over the last five years. India recently reached the milestone of 100 gigawatts of renewable capacity, and yesterday, the Prime Minister announced an ambitious target of 500 gigawatts by 2030, making it one of the largest clean energy programs anywhere in the world. There are many reasons for optimism with respect to achieving this target. First, the government is very focused on creating and enabling ecosystem and to developing the transmission and manufacturing sectors as well. We therefore do expect India to emerge as a global, low-cost supplier of solar panels, batteries, electrolyzers, and wind turbines, a diversification of the global clean energy supply chain that the world so desperately needs. Second, the newly set up National Green Hydrogen Mission is expected to scale up the manufacture and export of green hydrogen as well as that of renewable energy. Third, Prime Minister Modi's call for one sun, one world, one grid is built on the fact that the sun is always shining somewhere on our planet. Four, Renew, our company, recently signed a power purchase agreement for India's first round-the-clock green power project, marking the beginning of a new era, that of firm, schedulable, clean energy, considerably cheaper than coal, I might add. With all these steps, India has now emerged as a shining beacon on the hill, a key player in global climate change ambitions, while at the same time accelerating the country's economic growth. In the future, too, collaboration between various players, such as among governments, between corporates and governments, multilateral bodies, and technology providers, will be absolutely essential to decarbonize energy through renewables. I do believe that the private sector has an incredibly important role to play in helping the world deal with climate change more expeditiously and effectively inclusively, and above all, justly. I look forward to such a future and to making it happen collaboratively. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sumanth. Ensuring affordability of these clean technologies will certainly help drive demand and adoption. We also need to recognize that the Glasgow breakthroughs focus on sectors which are notoriously hard to abate. Martina, you've been recognized as one of Fortune's most powerful women internationally. You are not one to shy away from a challenge. Steel has been considered one of the most challenging sectors to decarbonize. 
Specifically, indirect electrification of the production process using green hydrogen will require coordination with local communities and planners. How will businesses need to partner with governments to accelerate this transition to deliver on this part of the Glasgow Breakthrough? Thank you, Dana, and hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event today. I'm very grateful to present our efforts regarding the green transformation. Next to many other businesses, Thyssen Group is also one of Europe's largest steel producers. And we will decarbonize our steel production by using hydrogen for the chemical reduction of iron ore. Here, we have a clear approach to decarbonizing our production, which is technologically mature as well as scientifically proven. But this transformation requires significant investments of historic dimensions. We need to completely change our production process. Therefore, the steel industry cannot be burdened by additional costs, such as rising CO2 prices. But we can only spend our money once, either for on regulatory framework or on the necessary investments. In addition, the transformation will require vast, vast amounts of green hydrogen. 720,000 tons are necessary every year, only for our steel production, which is one of the leaders amongst the 20 full-scale green plants under development worldwide by 2030. This tells you what a gigantic infrastructure is needed to cover the demands of all sectors in transformation. We must therefore quickly establish hydrogen production on an industrial scale and support its expansion all over the world. Here, we as Thyssen Group will be able to make a major contribution with our solutions for the large-scale production of green hydrogen. But the required quantities cannot be produced by one country alone. Therefore, it is crucial, it is crucial to think of hydrogen as a commodity on a worldwide market. The decisive factor is the timely development of the overall infrastructure for production, transport, and use of green electricity and green hydrogen within and between countries and communities. Accelerated planning and permitting is absolutely crucial for timely investments. Accordingly, single actions by individuals will not suffice. Because the green transformation is a challenge for society as a whole, the success of which is linked to the success and measures from all of us. Nationally and internationally, and together with policymakers who create the right framework for respective investments and multinational partnerships across all sectors will be successful. We at Thyssen Group are ready to further engage here and hope to continue fruitful talks and, first of all, future-oriented joint action. Thank you so much, Martina, for your comments and for leading such an important area of change. Julia, you have 20 years of experience in the mining industry, rooted in expertise as a qualified metallurgist and chemist. Fortescue Metals Group has been around for a long time, but Fortescue Future Industries was only founded in 2018. So it hasn't been in clean energy for long. What makes you and FFI confident that renewable hydrogen will be globally available and affordable by the end of the decade? Thank you, Julie. 
We are absolutely confident. Why? Because we are doing it. Fortescue started out simply as a map of tenements across Western Australia. Today, we are one of the world's largest mining companies. Fortescue's initial cost of production was over $50 per tonne. In less than 10 years, it was less than 15. Achieved by getting projects started, learning, getting the flywheel turning, scale, technology, innovation, down came the costs. No theoretical roadmap, I'm talking track record. And we'll do exactly the same with green hydrogen. The key is to get started. We're a big carbon emitter and we're doing something about it. We'll decarbonise our operations by 2030, slashing over 1 billion litres of diesel per year, using renewable electricity, green hydrogen and green ammonia. Where I work, trucks are seven metres high. They weigh 400 tonnes, but they're powered by diesel. So now we've built the world's first hydrogen mining truck and we'll be converting hundreds of trucks to green energy by 2030. Our trains are three kilometres long. We've got the fastest heavy haul railway in the world, but it's powered by diesel. So we've converted a train to run on green ammonia. It's currently at 70% and soon we'll have it at 90%. We're doing the same with ship engines, to run our ships on green ammonia. Why? Our ships are massive. They're over 330 metres long, and they burn the dirtiest fuel on the planet, marine fuel. So we've still got more work to do, but we've already established that we can run our mining trucks on green hydrogen, that we can run our trains and ships on green ammonia. And as a large, heavy emitting company, will be totally green this decade. So if we can do this, what's stopping any other heavy, hard to abate industry from doing the same? Nothing, just the will to make it happen. And at FFI, our mission isn't just in Australia. We're working on projects in over 20 countries to generate the huge amounts of hydrogen that the world is waiting for. By 2030, we'll make 15 million tonnes of green hydrogen. That's green hydrogen from renewable energy, not the dirty stuff, that's from fossil fuels. And the demand is already here. Just this week, we signed an agreement to supply enough green hydrogen to eliminate pollution from almost a quarter of the vehicles across Britain by 2030. So Dana, you asked me, is it possible for renewable hydrogen to be globally affordable and economical by 2030? Yes, it is. It's the green future our kids are waiting for us to take. Practical, implementable, now. Julie, thank you so much for that very confident and clear overview of how some transformations of some of the most difficult transport challenges are already occurring. Martin, that brings us to you. You're an experienced businessman and have led the green transition as president of the Volvo Group. And Volvo has a target to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions as early as 2040. The road to transport Glasgow breakthrough is to make zero emission vehicles the new normal by 2030. Martin, what should auto manufacturers do to make these vehicles accessible, more affordable, and sustainable across the regions? Thanks, Dana, and, and uh, thank you also for uh, inviting the Volvo Group to this uh, fantastic event. Uh, and. Uh, I have to say, actually, that uh, it's great that we have these uh, four uh, sectors uh, represented. And for us, of course, everything is coming together here. Power generation, uh, hydrogen, uh, steel, uh, and uh, trucking or transportation. And that is our 
uh, that is our core business together with construction equipment, etc. The good news is that transport actually is a very, very important driver for prosperity as we knew it and as we know it when it comes to financial development, but also social inclusion and, and a very important factor, for example, binding cities together and public transport, etc. But we know it must be considerably more sustainable because transport will grow across the globe and it will grow a lot uh, due to uh, many different mega trends and in particular also actually the drive for e-commerce, etc. So we have a challenge to be done here. We have said that long-term ambition could be nothing less than 100% safe because that is a very, very important factor, 100% more productive in order to cope with the planetary boundaries and 100% fossil free. And when we talk about the 2040 uh, net zero, that is the big thing for us is obviously uh, the scope three downstream. Uh, the products in use that we are providing to our customers around the globe. As a matter of fact, our scope one, scope two, and a big part of our scope three is already done. 20, 2008, it was the first big scale truck production in the world that became net zero in Ghent, Belgium, uh, thanks to a large scale deployment of uh, uh, renewable energies in, in the Volvo plants there. Uh, so, so it's really about scope three, and the good news about this scope three and, and uh, the science-based targets is really that, that are connecting parties in the value chain, right? Because what is my scope three is someone else's scope one or scope two, and we really need to connect together, and that is where partnerships are really starting. So the scope three play for us is obviously uh, two-folded. It is about battery electric vehicles that we are deploying at scale now, for medium trucks, but also uh, heavy duty applications and also for construction equipment. But that has certain limitations for, for some applications, and it has certain limitations also for the deployment as regards energy storage and, and grid capacity. So uh, fuel cell electric is also a very important part where we have joined forces with uh, uh, the other big, uh, the biggest group in the world regarding trucking, and that is the Daimler Group, where we have actually uh, formed a joint venture of producing at scale down fuel cell stacks 150 kilowatts. It's for sale, by the way, so if you want to have one, just come to me after. And, and uh, the good news is also that the fossil free steel journey has uh, also started. Martina's point here, we presented a couple of weeks ago now the first uh, mining hauler completely built in fossil free steel, uh, together with SSAB Vattenfall, that are also part of the first mover uh, coalition, and together with LKAB also. So that shows that the true partnership is horizontal here. Uh, so, I mean, what I think is important in this uh, journey now is that we take it seriously that we cannot find solutions on our own. System problems uh, require system solutions. And that is a challenge from time to time. It's fun also. It's really fun when we are really getting together. Uh, many of the things we can do in the industry, but we also need, of course, working together with authorities, with academia, and with political leadership. And that's the reason why we have joined also, as I said, the first, uh, first mover coalition that is part of them, the, the Glasgow breakthroughs here. So inventing, innovating, and first and foremost now implementing a, a lot of good solutions that we have, and I've heard that also from everyone here. So I would like to end, actually, uh, also for Vinicia, that I thought had the greatest speech of everyone, even that we have all these fantastic leaders here, uh, to actually quote one of my predecessors in Volvo, Gunnar Engela, who was the president of the group in the 60s. And he said, and I think about COP21, because a lot of things have happened uh, in six years, but he said the following then. He said, I take my hat off for everything that has been achieved, but I take my jacket off and I roll up I roll up the sleeves for the future. So let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That is extraordinarily encouraging progress, and particularly so because you're already deploying it. Um, now, a huge thank you to all of our incredible panelists who have taken time to join us here today at COP26 at the World Leaders Summit. The work you are driving forward in your sectors is truly inspiring. As business leaders across some of the biggest emitting sectors, this group has responsibility for driving the breakthrough agenda forward, demonstrating to others that clean technologies can be the most economical and attractive option. With thanks to the panelists, I will now draw this panel discussion to an end. 
and it's time to formally close this event with some final words. In conclusion, today we saw the launch of the Breakthrough Agenda, a critically important commitment by leaders for their countries to work together to accelerate the innovation and deployment of clean technologies. And the Glasgow Breakthroughs, a first set of global goals under this agenda that aim to make clean technologies the most affordable, accessible, and attractive option globally by 2030. I'm told 42 countries have officially endorsed the Breakthrough Agenda. Over the rest of the UK presidency, I'm sure that more and more countries will take this important step, and I'm personally excited to see how far the Breakthrough Legacy will go. As the global community, we have a lot still to be delivered. The Glasgow Breakthroughs are just the start of sectoral transformation, but we do now know what we need to do and how we're going to do it. By working together as governments, businesses, and civil society, we can do this. A huge thank you to all the world leaders, speakers, business leaders, and audience members who have joined us today. We hope you, have, you leave feeling inspired and stand ready to join up and scale up to usher in a decade of delivery resulting in a new positive future for everyone. Thank you very much.